is to remember that love is much more important than dogma. We don't really understand things with our mind. We can understand about things. We can know reasons for them. But understanding comes from the heart. And Ush has written a beautiful book. I've been reading it. And congratulations. Really? But she points out the importance of the heart to understanding. There was a very interesting case I read about a woman who had a heart transplant. And uh, you're not supposed to know who the person was who get transplanted, gave you your heart. But she found certain things were happening to her that she'd never had before. She suddenly <coughs> felt a desire for chicken. She'd never had such a desire before. And for restless music and different things that were totally different from anything she'd ever imagined. And she did check out and find out at last who this person was. He was an 18-year-old man who had been very restless, loved chicken, and many things that she had taken on because she had his heart. The heart, actually, that seems like an almost incredible thing because it seems like the heart is only an organ that pumps blood, but it's much more than that. Everybody in the world knows that it's here he suffers when he feels suffers heartbreak. I've never known a lonely swain, a heartbroken swain, to say my knee feels broken. <laughs> but many say that they feel it in their heart. Because you know that this is where you feel love. You don't feel it here, you feel it here. And you don't understand anything until you can feel it. You can know mentally all about it, but it's the heart's feelings. That's why it says in the Patanjali Sut Yoga Sutras that the definition of yoga is yoga's chitta vritti nirodha. Chitta is the feeling in the heart. And when you can calm those vrittis, those whirlpools of feeling in the heart, then you have calmness, you have yoga. The calmness of the heart, much more than of the mind. Vivekananda translated that as calming the waves of mind stuff. That isn't the, st it isn't the mind. It's there are three, four aspects of mind. Mon, buddhi, ahankar, chitta. Mon is the receiving mind. What it's, Sri Yukteswar explained it this way. It's like having a mirror, and you see a horse in that mirror, and you say, oh, that's a horse. First of all, you see it. You don't know what it is. You see the image. That's the mind. Then the intellect comes in and says, oh, that's a horse. Still doesn't mean anything. You can have uh, that much understanding and not be at all caught in delusion. Then comes the, the further thought, oh, that's my horse. Even that needn't be delusion. A hunker, uh, I'll tell you that story later. But then ha the heart comes in and say, oh, that's, I'm, how happy I am to see my horse. That's where delusion begins, with the feeling, mine, not mine. The master one time when he, was, when he wanted to start Ranchi school, he went to the Maharaja of Kashim Bazar and uh, he was a young man, and the Maharaja decided he wanted to test his scriptural knowledge before he would uh, sponsor a spiritual school. So he asked a group of pundits to come in and test his sp scriptural knowledge. And Master said they were all assembled there for, as if for a spiritual bullfight. <laughs> and he said, he said, let's not work on quotes from scripture. That doesn't indicate knowledge or wisdom. Hey, let's take something that I know is not in any scripture. The scriptures tell us that the four aspects of mind have their physical counterpart. Mon, buddhi, ahankar, chitta. Can you tell me where in the body those qualities of mind, aspects of mind are centered? Well, they didn't know because it wasn't anything they could quote. So he said, mon is centered here. Buddha, buddhi is centered in the point between the eyebrows. That's when you... Think deeply, you tend to knit your eyebrows. When somebody asks you a question, you, you knit your eyebrows. When you, uh, he said, ahankar, ego, is centered in the medulla oblongata. And uh, that is where the ego is centered. Whenever somebody's pre pleased with something you've said that flatters you, he, 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 he'll go, mm. <laughs> the movement will center from here. When somebody's arrogant, you notice the tension back here pulls his head back. 
And it's a universal thing. You don't have to say, well, I'm a Buddhist and I don't believe these things. If you're a human being, this will happen. In fact, if you're not a human being. <laughs> Yogananda talked about one time there was a dog that was uh, owned by a member, by, by not a member, uh, a neighbor uh, of his retreat in 29 Palms. And this dog, Bojo his name was, would come over when we were having lunch outside. And Master said, look at him. He's so concentrated on the food we're eating, his brow is furrowed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as I said, chitta is centered in the heart. Now, if you can calm the waves of chitta by accepting whatever comes with goodwill, without getting excited, without saying, I want this or I want that. And another interesting thing is, Vivekananda described them as waves. Chitta is not mind stuff, it's that this aspect of mind, the heart's feelings. But the, he also got the vrittis wrong, because vritti really means whirlpool, or eddy, and a eddy draws everything to a center. So every time you have a desire, or a like or a dislike, it creates a sort of a whirlpool around your ego, and it's one more cause for, for being trapped. Well, the way to get out of that ego, out of those eddies of, of, of uh, delusion and of attachment and likes and dislikes, is to watch a river. If the flow is weak, you'll find little eddies grow, going along the edges. But once the flow becomes strong, it dissolves all those eddies. And the way to really find your freedom is to have such a flow of divine love that nothing will be able to draw energy to itself. It carries everything along with it.